He built the cameras, he built the lenses, he built uh, the plates, he did everything in his studio. And again, required massive, massive, massive amounts to study hundreds of thousands of photographic plates. That had to be crazy. Okay. And, and, and again, historical archiving, because you can't properly store hundreds of thousands of photographic plates without knowing where they are. Yeah. Episode 37, Motion Pictures Are Autistic. Welcome to the Autistic Culture Podcast. Each episode, we dive deep into autistic contributions to society and culture by introducing you to some of the world's most famous and successful autistics in history. Before we get started, a quick disclaimer on how we use the word autistic. The purpose of the show is not to diagnose the people or characters we discuss as autistic. While some may have announced being autistic, what we're really sharing here is our observation of what is representative of autistic culture. It can sometimes be difficult for autistic people to celebrate our natural tendencies and traits due to the perception of autism as a disorder that needs to be fixed, a long history of damaging medical interventions to get autistics to fit in with mainstream culture, and protective masking skills many of us have developed to try to stay safe. Whether you are autistic or just love someone who is, your hosts, Dr. Angela Loria, the linguistic autistic. And licensed psychological practitioner, Matt Lowry, welcome you to take this time to be fully immersed in the language, values, traditions, norms, and identity of Autistica. Autistica. Hey, Angela, welcome back. Matt! Welcome back. We hiatus. Yeah, it was a busy, busy summer, but I think we got some good stuff done. Uh, I am so excited that we a took a break and b made it back here. I'm very yeah. proud of us. I I, I am uh, rejuvenated. I am energized, and oh my god, we've got some great new fun things to talk about. I am so excited for this episode. Uh, what one of the neat things about. Uh, Number one, doing the podcast is that we've got such good feedback from our listeners that said, hey, why don't you check this out? Why don't you check out this out? Why don't you check this out? So in doing so, we found all sorts of neat new topics and neat new people to talk about. And yeah, and keep those suggestions coming because we definitely want to make the episodes you want. I meant to tell you this before we started recording. I had no idea how to check our statistics. And you've asked me, like, how many downloads have we had? I'm like, I don't, lots. I don't know. 20,000. Oh my God, that's so many. 20,000. I didn't know Yay. where to look. I finally found the spot. So thank you for 20,000 downloads. And yes, we want to make episodes this season that you want to hear. So was this actually suggested by a listener? Yeah, yeah, it, it was. And uh, somebody said, hey, have you ever looked into this man, Edward Mybridge? And, and when I did... Oh my God, he is a fascinating, fascinating person, clearly autistic. But there there have been, Philip Glass did an opera about him. Oh. Uh, he was the uh, subject of a biopic. Uh, he has been uh, in numerous short films and cartoons, and he is the reason that motion pictures exist. It's so weird because I've never even heard his name. Oh, well, well, uh, he, he has or gone names. by several names. Yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, he, he was born Edward James Muggeridge. Uh, he he went by Edward Mygridge with a G and later became Edward Mybridge. Uh, e Edward spelled E-A-D-W-E-A-R-D because he, he fancied old Celtic uh, spelling. As so, you do. As one does. Mm -hmm. And he spent many, many years in the 1800s traveling the world and particularly the American Southwest, taking 
hundreds of thousands of photographs, and he invented the motion picture because of his fascination with movement. And uh, he's the subject of this is so this podcast is going to go all over the place. This episode is going to talk about uh, inventions. It's going to talk about travel. It's going to talk about medical trauma. It's going to talk about a murder <laughs> mystery. It's okay, going to talk about coming. Okay. <laughs> it's this man has lived a fascinating life, and I I hope to do it just by condensing his ridiculous, uh, impressive life uh, into the, the time that we have allotted. But okay, we'll, so set the scene for me. What year are we starting in? What, what, uh, oh, what year so are we talking about? We, we, are to, the, we, we begin our story on yes. the 9th of April, 1830. Oh. Yes. He okay. was born Edward James Muggeridge in Kingston-upon-Thames in England. Uh, and as I said, he changed his name many times from 1855 to 1865. He mainly used Moigridge. With, uh, so we, we are going to refer to him uh, as Edward Mybridge. But uh, again, he also uh, used the pseudonym Helios, Titan of the Sun. I do feel like we should just go with Helios, but I, I get you. We'll yeah. stick with Edward, but he is definitely in the family. Yeah, uh, and when he was in South America, he went by Eduardo Santiago Mybridge. Oh, yes, I love this man. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so this, so again, he, he was he was fascinated by history. He decided to go by Edward because that was uh, on the Kingston Coronation Stone, which is re erected in 1850 in his hometown, a hundred yards from his childhood family home. So, so anyway. He was born in Kingston upon Thames to a grain and coal merchant. And they lived in the same house and he learned business from his dad. And eventually his dad died and his mother took over. And at the tender age of 20, he decided to go off and seek his fortune. His grandmother said, here, have some money on your way. And he said, uh, he said the quote, no, thank you, grandma. I'm going to make a name for myself. If I fail, you will never hear of me again. Because that's that's dedication uh and again the we we will most certainly hear of him again so so anyway he landed in new york city in 1850 and guess what profession he chose mm, mm, bricklayer bookseller oh yay edward good call i like he, it he decided I'm going to a new country. What do people need? A bookstore. Books. So, I so agree. he he teamed up with a guy named Bartlett uh, to create Migridge and Bartlett, uh, which uh, a store lasted about a year. He spent his first years importing and selling books from the UK and became familiar with early photography through his acquaintance with New York uh, daguerreotypist Silas T. Selleck. Yes. Which, yeah, I, so, I know about this. I did my master's thesis on this tell topic. Us, tell us about it. Well, this was like super cutting edge time in photography. It was when they were doing this, these like impression photographs. And yes. it was like revolutionary. People were like, you can capture an image. And I sort of compared that to uh, some of the changes that were happening on the internet. You're not quite old enough, but we, for a long time on the internet, we were text only. We couldn't get pictures up there. It would take, take days and days. You had to mail them places. And so, yeah, so I wrote about what what a revolution it was when you could see a picture of something in a daguerreotype. Also, just for the record, first daguerreotype images were sexy time photos. Just like the early Internet. Yep, that's I, I did actually go to all the Internet sex shows to find out about without pornography, photography would not have developed. And the same is true for the Internet. I like the pun there. I like that pun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, photography well, developed. Photography developed. See what I did there? Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Taking things literally uh, since the beginning of time. It's a true yeah. story. So uh, were they doing sexy time photos? What were they doing? Oh, you have no idea. We're going to get into that later. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, such controversy. So, so yeah. So, so anyway, uh, with with Selick, uh, he 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 said, you know, this is pretty neat. I like this. So he got this uh, moderate interest in it. 
But uh, he went to New Orleans, uh, New Orleans in 1855, uh, became a book agent, and then arrived in California around the autumn of 1855, selling illustrated Shakespeare books. So, but the downside is that there are already 40 bookstores and a dozen or a dozen photography studios in town. Mm. Uh, so, and he even shared his address with a photo gallery next to another bookstore. Mm. Uh, bookstore on one side, photo gallery, bookstore on another side, like the Starbucks of the day. Yeah. So uh, he partnered with W.H. Oaks as an engraver and publisher of lithograph prints and still functioned as a book agent for the London Printing and Publishing Company. He was elected as one of the directors for the San Francisco Mercantile Library Association and then sold original landscape photography by Charlton Watkins. Uh, so... Uh, he said that uh, that's when he came to California and he began studying and engaged in photography. That's when it became a special interest. Wow. So that's uh, he decided that that's the direction that he wanted to give his life to. So he sold the bookstore business to his youngest brother, his oh. middle. He was going to sell it to his other brother, but his other brother died. Oh. So his youngest brother came over and took over everything. And he said, I have this day sold to my brother, Thomas S. Migridge, my entire stock of books, engravings, etc. I shall on the 5th of June leave for New York, London, Berlin, Paris, Rome, and Vienna. So, uh... I mean, this is impressive. Plans. Number one, he's still under 30 at this point. He's like between still under 30. Two, right. And then like number two, it like you could not just like book a flight. These had to be like, I don't know, boat ride. This feels hard. Oh, very much so. Year long voyages all around the world. So he had planned everything. And in July 1860, he got in a stagecoach and was going off to catch his boat. But uh, a runaway stagecoach crash at the Texas border killed the driver, one passenger, badly injured every other. Mybridge was ejected from the vehicle and hit his head, and he woke up in a hospital uh, like nine days later. He suffered from a bad headache, double vision, deafness, loss of taste and smell, and confusion. And it claimed that his hair turned from brown to gray in three days. So he is now uh, retroactive uh, as of this day, the subject of a medical mystery because many, many people have studied why he is as he is. And some people have said, oh, it's due, due to the head injury. Uh... Oh, it's due to this. Oh, no, it's. But what they didn't know is that he was largely like this before the accident. He was just a lot more open about it. So, but at the same time, the, he said that the, uh, the head injury caused him to reevaluate his life and have a greater appreciation of living in the moment. That's because, how I feel about COVID. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and this is, a, so he said that as the one thing that he did remember was watching the horse running as he was in slow motion, like, oh, and this is how I die. And he remembered the motion of the horse. Oh, this is going to matter later. Oh, yes, yes. Because he was probably and replaying it over and over in his head. He was. And so he, he woke up later on and said, yeah, I don't remember much of anything, but he did continue to have the fascination with the movement of the horse. Right. So he he was he traveled. He was treated in the States, went back to England, where he received medical care from Queen Victoria's personal physician. And the doctor said, you know, the cure of this is to uh, abstain from meat, alcohol and coffee for over a year and have some rest and outdoor activities. And he okay. said, you know, what's outdoors? Photography. Okay. But of course, you know, carrying around heavy equipment and working with chemicals in a dark room, not really conducive to health. But he decided that he was going to go out and create a new method of photography. He, so at this time, his first patent uh, is for a new method of plate photography because he, was, he did not like how inefficient and how many chemicals he had to use with the old one. And in the meantime, he also invented the washing machine. What? So, uh, what? Okay. What? <laughs> yeah. what, yeah. what did, was it related? Was he uh, like, oh, this would also work for a washing machine? Uh, he he might have said, uh, I don't know. I'm tired of getting chemicals on my clothes and washing them on a rock. But again, this is the kind of man that we are talking about who endlessly innovated, who endlessly had really big ideas and just casually traveled the world 
inventing things. Yeah, and this was so, the good old days before the patent office announced that everything that could be invented had been invented. I exactly. think that happened in the 1930s. So this was the heyday of patents. Yeah, yeah, all kinds of neat stuff. And th this wet plate collodion process. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, okay, yeah, that's yeah, him? Yeah. Oh, that's uh, him, okay. that's him. Yeah, he said, you know, because like uh, he was influenced by other photographers of the time, including Lewis Carroll. Oh. So he said, I want to do stuff like that, only better. So after that, he was apparently described uh, a changed man, more careless about his uh, appearance, more easily agitated, but he was an eccentric artist. In other words, he was unmasking. Exactly. It, because again, this tragedy that almost took his life, he said, I don't have a lot of time in this world. I'm going to get weird with it. Yeah. So me too, he, my he, guy. Me he, too. He decided to unmask. He decided to put it all out there and collect as much data as humanly possible. <gasps> I love it. So uh, they, they said his care about whether he judged something to be beautiful had become much stronger than his care for money. Oh. And he easily refused payment if a customer seemed to be slightly critical of his work. Yeah, I got you. Me too. So he, 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 he uh, not that uh, this is, I mean, this is an invention, but uh, he, he converted a lightweight two wheel, one horse carriage into a portable dar dark room because he wanted to go out into the wilderness and still develop pictures. Hmm. So uh, he, he dubbed it the Helios Flying Studio. <sighs> God, so that's, that's where awesome. he picked up the name Helios, Helios yeah. the, the god of the sun. Mm. And, and again, keep in mind that back in the day, uh, you needed uh, extensive sunlight because there was no way to you know, have artificial light to help develop pictures. Uh, you, you needed to stay in one place for an extended period of time in order for these chemicals to take their natural time to make these results. But uh he, he became extremely proficient. And these, and um, so when you're thinking about these, if you're trying to picture these wet plate pictures, they look, uh, well, I'll see if we can put in the show notes some links, but they look like those oh, yes. oldie timey like sepia pictures. So it's not quite black and white. They, they're they like a weird color, but the daguerreotypes were more like outlines of things. Yes, yeah. And, and this was like much closer. It's a forerunner of, you know, what you might take on your phone today, but it definitely looks more like a photograph. Uh, yeah. And this is the thing, because he wanted to capture life as it existed. He 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 knew that, you know, these these vague images existed. But again, at the time, they required a lot of artistic touch up and a lot of artistic license to it. He wanted to capture things as they are. So he he focused a lot on landscape and architecture because that was a, a well, great Well, and way. that makes sense because the exposure was like, I don't know how long people had to sit there, but it was like 15, hours. 20 minutes. Oh, even hours. Yes. Oh, well, well for, for a good f photograph. Right. And so when there are those group photos, everyone was just like. Yeah. yeah. And that's the reason nobody's smiling because no one can hold a smile for that long. Yeah. Everyone's deadly serious because they're like, we've got one shot at this. It, this is the only photograph we will ever have. So landscapes are at least kind because they're less likely to be, you know, blinking and messing up the picture. So this is his advertisement. Uh, so uh, do you want to read that? Yes, I most certainly do. Uh, so the, uh, Helios is prepared to accept commissions to photograph private residences, ranches, mills, views, animals, ships, etc., Anywhere in the city or any portion of the Pacific coast, architects, surveyors, and engineers' drawings copied mathematically. Correct. I think mathematically correctly, yeah. but fine. Fo photographic copies of paintings and works of arts. So this because is, again, so yeah. this is his business. He's now going to come. You're going to pay him, and he's going to take a picture of your ranch. Yeah, uh, take a picture of ranch, take a picture of art, because again, at the time, the only way to see like uh, the Mona Lisa was to actually travel and see the Mona Lisa, because if somebody took a picture, they would still have to draw the Mona Lisa on top of the picture. Right. So he, he, he was dedicated to a true-to-life photography. 
So he constantly tinkered with his cameras and his chemicals. He he became adept in mechanical engineering to build a better camera. Mm. He, in 1869, he patented a sky shade to reduce the tendency of intense blue outdoor skies to bleach out the images of blue sensitive ph photography, photographic emulsions of the time. So uh, uh, an article in 2017, an expanded book, document that Mybridge heavily edited and modified his photos, inserting clouds or the moon, or even adding volcanoes for As artistic effects. I, because I a man with that. A man named Helios is not one for subtlety. <laughs> right. Okay, so, so he had some airbrushing going on. Obviously, you just dash in the little volcano as needed. Sometimes and, the and, picture's missing something. Let's put a volcano. So, and with these, he, he uh, produced stereograph cards and he produced 400 different stereograph cards, sort of like postcards, and that he could sell in a very large quantity for a very low price as souvenirs to collectors to say, hey, look at this art that I have. I have art now because, you know, again, at the time, having a stereograph was a big deal. So it's it's very neat. Uh, you you put them in your uh, like the, the little viewer, and you look. Uh, it, it's essentially a view master. Oh yeah, viewfinder. So, yeah, totally yeah, yeah. got it. So yeah. yeah, you have this little three D thing, and he was able to create this. So uh, at that point, he was hired by Robert B. Woodward to take an extensive collection of photos of Woodward's gardens, a combination amusement park, zoo, museum, and aquarium in San Francisco. So, uh, and while he was there, the great uh, San Francisco earthquake happened oh. in uh, 1868. So the photographs of the earthquake are my bridges. Oh. So he just... So he sold a lot of photographs of this. And uh, so during the construction of the San Francisco Mint, he made a series of images of the building's progress, documenting changes over time, uh, which would now become time-lapse photography. So he, again, he loved movement. He loved the progression of time. He loved this study. And that got the attention of a man named Leland Stanford. Leland Stanford was a robber baron who later became the governor of uh, uh, California. But we're, we're going to hear more about this man later on. So, so anyway, from June to November of 1867, Moybridge uh, visited Yosemite Valley, and he was not a safe man. Uh, he took his heavy camera, stacks of glass plate negatives, hung himself off of rocks, uh, dangled himself around 2,000 feet over empty spaces, uh, in return with a ton of stereoscopic views and larger plates. He selected like 20 pictures to be retouched and manipulated for a subscription series because, you know, all good artists have a subscription series, don't we? That's actually true. We're, we're, for season two, we're launching our subscription series. You can join us on Substack with our new subscription. And we'll do all kinds of neat stuff because yeah. there's all sorts of neat bonuses. Because again, I've met so many neat people. I feel like we, uh, we owe you some cool stuff and some cool merch. Yeah. So wait, uh, what did you get with his subscription? Oh, uh, so uh, he got the pictures, 20 original photographs that were later used to illustrate John S. Hiddle's guidebook to Yosemite, its natural wonders and its beauties. Okay, so, I like uh, it. Come the, in. The, the book referred to him as a romantic who sought out the uncanny, the unsettling, and the uncertain. And uh, he was commissioned by the U.S. government to travel to brand new territory of Alaska to photograph the... Uh, I'm going to mangle this, and I apologize. Tinglingit Native Americans, occasional Russian inhabitants, and the dramatic landscapes of Alaska. Wow. So he got he got to travel to the new frontier. That's a pretty and, cool gig. Oh yeah! And in 1871, the United States Lighthouse Board hired him to photograph lighthouses of the American West Coast. Okay, these are all good gigs, but can I just say this is all way too outdoorsy for me? I need to do activities on my couch. Yeah, yeah, he he was. I feel like he, he was needs, a remarkably adventurous person. Yeah, this is like shoes. Like, how good was the camping gear then? I I feel like it's gonna be cold, loud. I don't I don't know if I want, but I'm very excited. He took like early pictures of Alaska and lighthouses, and sent to document the Modoc War between Native Americans and Northern Californians. How did I miss out on that war? Okay, yeah, my guy. 
As always, this podcast is free and it will remain free, but we do now have a paid subscription over on our Substack page, which we wanted to tell you about. It includes lots of extras like private Q&A calls with Matt and I, our book club with our favorite book picks and discounts in our Tee Public store. You can check out all the goodies over on our Substack page at autisticculture.substack.com. So, so at this time, uh, Leland Stanford, the resource owner, businessman, robber baron, uh, 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 the tycoon and uh, uh, train governor? Uh, railroad magnate and governor of California, <laughs> yeah. hired him for a portfolio depicting his mansion and other possessions, including... His racehorse, Occident. Okay. He wanted a proper picture of the horse running at full speed because... (gasps) Exactly. Back to the horses running. Back to the horses running. Because, again, back in the day, there was no way to capture motion. Everything just looked like a blob. I hope you're going to tell me he made a flip book. He invented the flip book. Oh! Oh, this is so good. Ain't, oh, yes. Yes. Ain't nothing going to break in his stride. Nobody going to slow him down. And again, so back in the day, artists had difficulty properly representing movement because the movement was quicker than the human eye. And no one knew how horses' muscles moved. No one, you, you had theories because, you know, you could take a cadaver and move it manually and say, oh, look at this. But again, you couldn't capture the majesty of actual movement and insert heavy breathing noises on Edward's part. He was all about this stuff. So he, he managed to use a single camera to shoot a small and very fuzzy picture of Occident running. And uh, it was essentially a blurry silhouette. And they both agreed that it wasn't great, but it's better than most. So he decided to uh, get a team of engineers and technicians from the Central Pacific Railroad, because again, Robert Barron railroad stuff. So he experimented with increasingly faster mechanical shutters, developing state-of-the-art electrically triggered mechanisms, and experimented with more sensitive photographic emulsions to work with the shorter exposure times. So he 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 invented better and better cameras, better and better uh uh, exposures, better and better photographing equipment. So in July 1877, he made a new picture of Oxenet at full speed, which resulted in much clearer result. And uh, it had it retouched by a retouch artist and was published as a cabinet card. But this, this was the thing that started everything because now he's going to have a battery of 12 cameras across the racetrack to okay, see it wait. in this position, you in gotta, this position, in this position. You got to, that makes so much sense now that you're saying it. What year have we gotten to at this point? 1878. Oh. Wow. Early, 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 because at this point, he was able to have the horses activate the cameras themselves at certain point in the motion. So you could see the horse with feet on the ground, feet up in the air, feet on the ground, feet up in the air. And they were automatically triggered when the wheel of a cart or the breast or legs of a horse tripped wires connected to the electromagnetic circuit. Engineering genius, this man. Uh, And his team of engineers, which we cannot, you know, understate that. So one session, the press and a selection of turfmen were invited to witness the process. And uh, there was news of this worldwide. Even the most diehard skeptics saying, no, you can't possibly do this. were like, oh my God, you did this. And it became like magic. Yeah. So he he started showing magic lantern projected slides of the photographs, having uh, essentially uh, a projection of the pictures onto a wall. Uh, I, I don't know how old I, the people listening to this are, but if you ever had an old overhead projector or, you know, film strips or no, I don't know. an amazing scene in The Greatest Showman. Oh, where yes, yes, It's like yes. a million dreams, I think, is the song. And they're yes. um, hanging laundry on white sheets and the lantern is projecting images. Yes. yes. So he, he started showing off his pictures. And Scientific American uh, started reporting on him because they were groundbreaking. Uh, six uh, were uh, soon published as cabinet cards entitled The Horse in Motion. Uh, 
because he was the first to study kinesiology, mm-hmm. the, the study of sure. movement. Sure. So uh, they were amazed that this is the first time that they realized that horses essentially don't just jump along the horse, that there is a rhythm of horse leg movement, and that uh, <laughs> uh, all four hooves were not, uh, not all in the air at the same time, uh, that uh, the, the tail moved, that the body moved, that it was switching from pulling with the front legs to pushing with the back legs. This was all groundbreaking stuff for <laughs> artists, for biologists, for enthusiasts of all types. So uh, he, he went, then went to 24 cameras. And uh, the more cameras, the better, because the more pictures you had. And so this is when he invented the motion picture. Mm. Because, again, looking at one picture at a magic lantern is great. But if you had a glass disc and put all these pictures all around the glass disc and spun the disc, all of a sudden the horse was running. And this was astonishing because no one had ever seen a horse run on a wall before. And this was the zoopraxiscope. Zoo, animal, prax, movement, scope. So the animal movement scope, the zoo praxiscope, were, were, uh, they were ve- very detailed but hand-colored, marketed commercially. He sold movies to the public. Wow. So people could study on a movie projector. So he invented motion pictures and cinematography. Wow. In okay. 18, oh yeah. The, I want to stop you here. We're up to you know, like the big moment. What do you see as you're reading his story that makes you say, "Oh, this is emblematic of autistic culture"? Like these are, uh, if somebody wasn't a part of our culture, they wouldn't do these things. To, so tell this me is what the thing notice. we we have. Our monotropism is all consuming. We love studying the things that we love to study. We have this bottom-up data acquisition style. And at the time, there were a lot of people who said, yeah, it's fuzzy, but it will do. He said, no, I really, really want to study how this horse moves. I need to... I need to do better. I need better tools. I need, need, I need more cameras. I need everything. So his... His, his search for knowledge acquisition, mm. his search for the truth, his search for the accuracy. This is an autistic trait. We, we need to understand the world around us. We need to be very highly detail oriented. We need to do these things in order to give ourselves peace. And this is a huge thing. Plus, again, the artistic integrity, the not caring what other people think. Uh, again, everything after the carriage accident, it seems like he was very much unmasking because yeah. he was very much trying to fit into the world and be a businessman. And then he said, screw it. I'm doing what I love. Yeah. And what I love is photographs and improving the photographs and traveling and seeing and just getting all of this new data. But but so, the biggest stuff comes. Uh, oh, we're getting with the there. crazy stuff. I want to talk oh, about yeah. one more thing though, because oh, yes. I have been thinking about this a lot. About when we talk about pathologizing autism, one of the I don't know symptoms in that pathologized medical model is OCD. Oh yeah, and so. I can completely, I've definitely had things like this horse running that oh, yeah. you have, maybe there's some trauma there. I mean, there's definitely trauma there. He almost died, but you have this imprinted image and then you play it over and over again. And it ends up being put into like a mental illness bucket, unless you have like the privilege he had. So like, let's note, he is a white guy. Oh yeah. Like as a woman, I couldn't have done this. If you're a queer person, you couldn't have done that, you know, in any sort of out way, you would have had to hide that. If you're a person of color trying to run around Alaska in the 1800, like he was able to have this, what could have been pathologized as an OCD, turn into an amazing career and a gift, you know, to the world, which is awesome. But do you think there is a line between monotropism and like fixation and commitment and focus versus an OCD that is pathologized and needs to be medicated or something. 
Well, uh, I think those are two separate questions because number one, I think that a lot of people will pathologize anything. Yeah, they sure because, will. Because uh, mm -hmm. I'm sure that somebody will say, well, that's far too many lightsabers when yeah. I have a lot of lightsabers because I will have all of the lightsabers. All of them. But, <laughs> uh, but I think that the, the bigger thing comes with uh, how much it impacts a person's uh, happiness. Yeah. Because if a person, because again, if he sat in a hospital room thinking about the horse that almost stomped his head over and over and over again for the end of time, and it caused him great distress, that would be a thing. But for him to say, I want to use this as a motivator to better understand. And it became, it became this liberating art and science and it yeah. gave him new opportunities. So I, I think that that's, there's a double-edged sword on so many autistic traits, depending on which direction you have the resources to go in. Yes, yeah, so well said. So well said. Because again, uh, we've, we, uh, if you haven't already heard, uh, we which episode was uh, Horses Are Autistic, where we covered My oh, Little ponies. Pony. And, ponies are autistic. Yes. We'll put that yeah, in the yeah. show notes. Yeah. Yeah. Because there are a great many people who enjoy horses and ponies and My Little Pony. And uh, some people try to pathologize that. But uh, equine therapy is remarkably healing for autistic people. I've done it. It was very powerful for me. Yeah. yeah. So again, I think it's which, if you have the resources to turn it into something great, it's a definite positive. But if you don't, that's where we run into the thing. This is why, yeah, that's why we have this, uh, uh, we, we need more resources for autistic people. And uh, that's, I think that that's the biggest thing here. So yeah, yeah. Uh, he, he was very, very fortunate in that he, he presumably had money to travel to the new world and presumably had money to establish a bookstore and had this capital to do all these fantastic experiments and had the social freedom. Because again, uh, if someone else started photographing naked people, which he definitely did photograph a lot I of naked it, people. I knew it. I knew it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, yeah, we'll we'll get into that in a bit. Okay. Uh, but yeah, because because this is where we come into true crime territory. Okay. Because if there's something that podcast listeners love, it's true crime. True. So th around this time, he married uh, his his wife, Flora Shellstone Cross, a recent divorcee who is 21. He was 41. So there was, uh, back in the 1870s, this was a, a bit of an age difference. Also, Even today, it's a bit of an age difference. she was divorced already at 21? Yeah. Already divorced at the age of 21 because okay, uh, okay. She, she enjoyed, uh, let's say, a more active lifestyle than Edward did. Okay. Because while Edward uh, did enjoy, you know, traveling and taking pictures of beautiful landscapes, he also really, really loved staying up late at night reading the classics. Whereas she wanted to go out with friends and go out to the theater and go out to other attractions. And this created a massive gap between them because he was like, oh yes, we're married, everything's fine. And she said, well, he leaves me for weeks on end and just likes to read books and I would rather, rather stay out and party. So it uh, there, there was some discussion about these things, including when uh, she started hanging out with one of their mutual friends, Harry Larkins. And uh, Mybridge said, you know, uh, you're spending a lot of time with Harry there. Uh, what's up with that? And she said, oh, no, nothing. Uh, and he said, well, you know, uh, he took you to the theater several nights in a row. That's a, that's a little awkward. And she said, no, we're just friends. And then uh, in April 1874, she gave birth to a son uh, named Florado Helios Mybridge. Okay, got that Helios in there. Little obsessive. <laughs> and uh, he he learned that uh, that uh, he and uh, his that uh, his wife and Harry were a little more than friends. Ooh. And he came across a picture of their son with Harry written on the back. Ooh. So he he very much believed that uh, his son, who he by all accounts, incredibly adored and took pictures of, as one would do, uh, was fathered by Harry. So he went, uh, at this point, Harry had been sent to Cagliosta, California. Uh, Cal 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 uh, Calistoga? Calistoga? You Calistoga. know where that is? That's where all the where? wine is. Ah, well, yeah. Uh, well, there probably had, wasn't wine there yet, though. But uh, Well, I hope for his sake there was, because he tracked him down and said, I have a message for you from my wife. 
and shot him point blank. <gasps> oh. So Larkins died that very night, and Mybridge uh, volunteered to go to jail uh, in Napa. So uh, a Sacramento Daily Union reporter came and visited him. He said, yeah, I'm fine. Uh, murdered my wife's lover. You know, as one does. And uh, apparently he treated everyone in jail well. And But somebody was beating up on a, a, a Chinese immigrant. And he, he apparently laid into the people claiming, no man of any country whose misfortune shall bring him here shall be abused in my presence. And uh, just politely said that he was going to, you know, unalive the person uh, who was bullying around this Chinese dude. All right, so well, you know, he, we're into fairness and justice, so there you go. And he, he also had the same thing about an outburst of profanity. He, he did not tolerate this, so the jail became a very peaceful place with him around because he did not tolerate this nonsense, mm. as is our way. We <laughs> say that is not right. I'm going to shut it down immediately. This shall not be done. So uh, around this time, uh, surprisingly, his wife filed for divorce. So uh, she she did not carry for care for him murdering her lover, mm. as one does. So he or just she murder found, in general. Yeah, I yeah, try not to stay married to murderers. Browning on the murder. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's that's a bit of a bridge too far. So she filed for divorce on the seventeenth of December in eighteen seventy four, and he was tried in eighteen seventy five. This trial is historic and is in law of textbooks. So a friend of Stanford, again, rich dude with all the resources in the world, W.W. Pendergrast, pleaded insanity due to the head injury, due to the stagecoats accident. From and all those years ago? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Even though, you know, it had happened many, many years ago. Mm -hmm. Four time, long, four long time acquaintances testified that he he was different. He had, uh, in fact, cracked up since the accident. Exactly. But at the same time, my bridge said, no, I'm definitely not insane. I definitely went in there and I planned to murder him. I, 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 I decided to murder him and I went to murder him and I murdered him. And then I went to jail because I murdered him. And he was defined as, quote, impassive indifference and uncontrolled explosions of emotion because he went from being very matter of fact, as we tend to do, to being very passionate, also as we tend to do. So uh, this is where uh, American composer Philip Glass I know Philip Glass from the Candyman series because it's spooky, but you, you probably know Philip Glass. I love Glass. Philip Glass. He, yeah, I'm more into he, like the new agey twinkle sounds, but yeah. Yeah. So so he created the opera The Photographer based on the transcripts from this case. It's great. And they are important to both historians and forensic ne neurologists because of all the sworn testimony regarding his mind, mental state, his past behavior. But again, these all focus on trauma and not what if he was autistic to begin with. Mm -hmm. Because again, autism plus trauma looks very, very differently than, but again, you know, they didn't use the word autism back in the 1870s anyway. So, right. you know, right. So this was historic because he was, he was the last person in the country to be acquitted by justifiable homicide. This, this was a game changer because the jury explained in their verdict that th their verdict was not in accordance with the law. It was in accordance with the law of human nature. They believed that they could not punish a person for doing something that they themselves would do in similar circumstances. What? Yes. You have to be kidding me. That is true. And that he was the last person to get off on this reasoning. Uh, this is some serious white privilege. What Very. is happening? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He literally, so, they're like, we all agree you did it, but who wouldn't have killed that guy? He yeah. fucked your wife. Yeah, yeah. He walked in and said, yeah, I think I'm going to kill him. Traveled all the way to California, or all the way to Napa and said, yeah, I think I'm going to kill him. Walked in the door. I think I'm going to kill you. Killed him and said, yeah, I think I killed him. I believe I that's called premeditated murder. Yeah. Yeah. So so he decided after this, you know, murder kerfuffle uh, to uh, plan to go on a nine month photography working exile. So uh, oh, sweet, few copies of these Jesus. photographs were okay. produced. Mm -hmm. uh, he 
He developed his ability to take pictures more rapidly because he was on a ship that kept bouncing up and down, and you had to work quickly. So uh, the uh, Flora finally got a divorce uh, in April 1875, but died suddenly in July uh, because uh, while he was in Central America, uh, she uh, was apparently quite ill at the time. Again trying to get divorced from his murderer, being right. a single mother at that time. She placed her son, Florado, later named Flotty by friends, uh, with a French couple. And in 1876, uh, uh, Mybridge had the boy moved from a Catholic orphanage to a Protestant one and paid for his care. But again, this because This is giving he, Les Mis. This is yeah. seriously like there is a castle on a cloud. I'm ready for master of the house rounds. Okay. Yeah. And uh, apparently he paid for his care, but he believed that Harry Likens was his father, uh, even though photography later on said that he really, really looked like Mybridge. No! So it's incredibly tragic. He, oh, he spent the rest dude. of his life, he was put to work on a ranch as a boy, worked all his life as a ranch hand and gardener, and then he was killed by a car in Sacramento in 1944. Stop it! Yeah. This it is was a tragic. tragic. Yes, yes. This Tra tragic. again. This this is there. Are, there have been several. There was at least one movie. I uh, for the podcast. I watched one of the movies, Edward, and it is incredibly dramatic. And I don't know if they realize this, but the portrayal is very, very autistic. I don't know if the actor that they got is autistic or if you know, it was just a direction choice. But oh my god, it, it seeps through. And yeah, there there is a lot of this incredible drama. It's a a ridiculous story that is all true. So so he often traveled to American cities. He t took pictures of the railroad and steamships. Uh, he he uh, well he lectured at the Royal Institution in London, including members of King Edward the Seventh's royal family. Showed photographs on screen and projected the zoopraxiscope lectured at the Royal Academy of Arts and the Royal Society. Let's see here. Uh, he asked his friend and horseman, Dr. J.B.D. Stillman, to write a book analyzing the horse in motion using all of his photographs. Uh, but this is where the, the, the breakdown between him and Stanford, uh, you know, uh, again, the California robber baron who oh, right. financed this everything. Oh, right. This is the governor guy. Be okay. Because, because uh, he decided not to give uh, any credit to Edward for this book or any of the pictures. Mm. So he filed a lawsuit, delayed for two years, dismissed out of court, and said, screw you guys, I'm going home. Screw so, you guys, I'm going home. Exactly. So he he took more. He went. He made a new studio in Philadelphia. Uh, took more than one hundred thousand photographs. Again, eighteen eighty three to eighteen eighty six. One hundred thousand photographs. That is a lot of photographs. And this was all about. Uh, he 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 made more high quality lenses. Simultaneous pictures from multiple viewpoints. Clarity and range. Took a lot of pictures of animals, took a lot of pictures of people, moved into the hole, studying movement of human beings, and angered a lot of people by taking a lot of pictures of naked people. Aha! Uh -huh. So, because he now said, I want to see the naked people. I want to see how the people move, and I can't see it because of all the clothes, including all the naked ladies who tended to wear a lot of clothes at the Which time. Which actually does make sense of why he was so into animals, because you can, like, see the movement yeah. more. So you can, you can I just see the looked movements this up of the muscles. As we're talking, Kodak oh, yes. first opened their doors in 1888. So yes, this yes. is all happening like pre-Kodak. Because what are we up to now? We're like right around this. A 1884 at this yeah. point. Uh, yeah. So I, like, I don't even understand. I mean, obviously he's not buying film, but this cannot be cheap a hundred that I was like how much is a hundred thousand pictures yeah. cost and I was going to check that out because obviously I need to fact find while you're talking of and, course this is the way yes and then I was just like oh there wasn't even Kodak everything he did he had to get like the raw materials and make it yeah yeah 
and yeah, develop he, it he, himself. He built the cameras, he built the lenses, he built the, the plates, he did everything in his studio. And again, required massive, massive, massive amounts to study hundreds of thousands of photographic plates. That had to be crazy. Okay. And, and, and again, historical archiving, because you can't properly store hundreds of thousands yeah. of photographic plates without knowing where they are. And that shit's going to fade out too. Like they didn't exactly. have all the, I don't know, preservatives and additives, whatever we have now that makes pictures not fade out. Exactly. Okay. This so, is all very so, odd. And I didn't think they yeah. had like storage. There was no easy storage facilities either. No, no. So he had to build all of this stuff. I don't understand and, history. And, and he... He could only take photographs during the day. During the day, during the day because, we don't have yeah. lighting. Yeah. So during the day, he took photographs. During the night, he developed the photographs. Okay. So uh, again, people were very, very upset that he started photographing naked people and was notorious for saying, yeah, we'll photograph this, stripping down naked and doing a sequence where he was like, man with watering can, man climbing ladder, man swinging pickaxe, all while naked. So okay. because he's like... I will do this thing. You can't stop me from doing this thing. And they say, well, it's pornographic. And he said, is this pornographic? And like, I don't know, but I don't want to see it, man. Uh, so he, again, not doing it for, you know, any sort of sexual motivation. He just really wanted to study people. You and know, even, like autistic people generally have like less money on average than neurotypical people. But if we just like got rid of money and everybody could have anything they wanted, how much crazy shit would autistic people be doing? Oh God, yes. Yeah, the unlimited research. Right? Unlimited research, unlimited naked pictures. In this guy's case, like I gotta, I gotta get the data. I'm not going to yeah. do an autopsy on myself, so I got to take a picture from every angle. Uh, would you like to know all the difference? Of, so, so he he borrowed animals from the Philadelphia Zoo. Okay. So he got animal uh, elephants and horses and all kinds of stuff. But okay, so these are all the things that naked people were photographed doing against a measured grid. Okay. Right? So he put this grid up to have them walking across and doing these activities, including walking up or down stairs, which inspired new descending a staircase, hammering on an anvil, carrying buckets of water, throwing water over one another, uh, farm, industrial con construction, household work, military maneuvers, everyday activities, including athletic activities like Baseball, cricket, boxing, wrestling, discus throwing, ballet dancing. Uh, let's see here. Showing a single-minded, monotropic, dedication to scientific accuracy and artistic composition. And, of course, he himself was naked, uh, doing all kinds of stuff, too. So he he spent most of his time doing this. And that's, he, he wanted, his, his massive, massive, uh, collection was published in uh, 11 volumes, oh, 781 God. of his best plates comprising 20,000 of the photographs in a groundbreaking collection entitled Animal Locomotion, an Electrophotographic Investigation of Consecutive Phases of Animal Movement. Because, you know, animals moving does not cut it. You no. need to be as pedantic yeah. as possible. I really feel like he really would have liked Alfred Kinsey. Oh, God, yes. Oh, like oh he and Kinsey. Right? Oh, my God, they would have been besties. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry you guys didn't get to meet, but we'll bring you here on this episode. The Kinsey episode, I think, is 35. So check that it, one out if you want another science, obsessed science nerd talking one of the about greatest sexy time. One of the greatest quotes ever of everyone enjoys displaying and rearranging their collections as one does. Because, yeah, again, this is that's what he was like. He's like, I mean, who doesn't have like a collection of bugs and then you like reorganize them by size or shape or height or the day you acquired them or how long their name is? Like, obviously, we're like, yeah, we get yeah. you. <laughs> We love hearing from our listeners. So head over to this episode on Substack and leave us your comment. It's autistic culture, all one word, dot substack dot com. That's autistic culture dot substack dot com. So, so around this time in 1888, the University of Pennsylvania donated an album of the photographs to the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire, Abdul Hamid II. And Abdul Hamid II 
apparently love photography. So he, he said, you know what? I would love Edward to come over here and photograph the excavation because we really want to know about the Ottoman region of Mesopotamia, now Iraq, uh, notably the site of Nippur. Uh, the, so the Ottoman sultan said, yes, let's make this happen, and uh, gave him a whole bunch of photographs from the Abdul Hamid uh, the second collection. Mm. So uh, he went to France. He he uh, met. Uh, you may be able to pronounce this name better than I because my French pronunciation is very poor. Uh, Etienne Ewell's Murray. It's Murray. So Stephen Murray. For those yeah. of you. <laughs> Uh, if he was to come to America, Bob. Yeah. You know, so so he uh, visited the studio and they shared techniques, uh, pioneered multiple exposure uh, in a rotary shutter called the Marais wheel camera. Ah. So again, he started studying uh, surgeries and cardiology and aerodynamics and chronophotography because again, he studied sure. movement and time and mm -hmm. all this kind of stuff. So again... Uh, this this thing of he, he essentially invented the flip book because many of his pictures were reproduced in flip book format because that way you could flip through and look at the motion and they're like oh my god this magic book is moving yeah so or yeah. didn't they also have those I feel like there was like something my grandmother had that was like a lamp that would spin you'd like look inside yeah. oh, the lamp that, that that is a zoetrope. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember. Yeah, yeah. My oh, grandmother yeah. had an oldie timey one. It smelled. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Zoetropes uh, uh, had a lot of his images because of the horses moving. Makes sense. So. Uh, that's the one that I saw. I, had the, I know exactly that horse image. Yeah. So, right. so he, he lived a fantastic, crazy, crazy, crazy life until prostate cancer took him in May of 1904. I think they say like most guys die with prostate cancer. Like yeah, it's just it's, there at the end. It's yeah, kinda it's our, our prostates inevitably betray us. It's not. Yeah, it's you, like, yeah, you don't need that anymore. So he was what, like 70, 80, 75? Yeah. Uh, uh, oh man, what I, I didn't put that in. Uh, yeah, 1830 to, uh, yeah, 74. Okay, that's not bad. I mean, especially so, yeah. considering all the hiking he had to do. I feel yeah. like all that hiking would take at least a decade off my life. Yeah, and, and and at the time, you know what he was doing? Mm. Uh, he he was at the home of his cousin, Catherine Smith, in Kingston upon Thames again, and they were in the backyard excavating a scale model of the American Great Lakes. So they decided they wanted a scale model of the American Great Lakes in their backyard. Okay. Autism runs in families, people. Ah! Autism runs in families. That's all yeah. I have to tell you. Yeah. So, so uh, he he was uh, cremated and ashes were put in a grave, but his uh, name was misspelled as Edward Maybridge. But uh, according to people, his influence has forever changed our understanding and interpretation of the world. It can be found in many diverse fields. Uh, again, oh, so uh, again, we wouldn't have the Matrix with bullet time without his <gasps> techniques. Didn't think of that, of course. Yes. Because he was a huge influence on the Wachowskis and their implementation of bullet time. Wow. So the this this ability Wait, I want to put in the show notes. Did you say there was like a biopic about him? Oh, what? yes, yes. Edward. Yeah. Uh, Edward. Yeah. All right. With, with his funky spelling. Uh, it's, it's a very, very, uh, and again, very, very autistically uh, coded, but again, uh, the they, they kind of combined elements of his life because they, uh, they, they moved around some events because again, uh, the, the culmination of the movie is with the trial, but he didn't take pictures of all the naked people until after the trial. And if you're going to take, have a movie about, you know, photography, you got to add that in there. So, so, so they was, like, yeah, they wanted to so be the they naked pictures. And life. he never got like arrested for the naked pictures? No, no, there was a lot of uproar because again, indecency and all that. But again, every time the people complained, he just got naked himself and said, hey, we'll do this. Okay, what a guy, what a guy. And so without him, motion pictures might have never found their way to us. Motion pictures, cartoon animators still today use his references for animals moving, for people moving, to teach 
if you ever need to draw a man with a pickaxe, you got Edward's naked pictures. Uh, the YouTube video Lemon was filmed as a tribute to Edward Mybridge with their uh, black and white uh, grid in the background because that's how he did it because he wanted to measure movement objectively. So there's there are uh, if you check out the Wikipedia page, there are dozens and dozens of references to all of the stuff that has uh, influenced directly and again that's not even including the field of motion pictures and cartoons and uh, uh the zoetrope and uh the motion pictures in general so we we live in like, like all people he had his ups he had his downs there was that murder that one time yeah yeah but mm-hmm. you know it's he lived a varied and fantastic life that very very much impacted the people around uh, so yeah, our world would not be the same without him and yeah. definitely one of us. Definitely one of us. Well, you know, I think autistic culture is at the heart of it for me is monotropism and being able to focus on something and catch so many details is such a unique aspect of our culture. I think it's something that falls into like why people think we're weird because most people would just move on. But why they would move on is they're not seeing as many things as we see. Yeah. And so I so I think like who else but an autistic person could have developed the first motion pictures because it's just something that you could fixate on until you could do it. It was right at the edge of being possible and he just like pushed that edge. Yeah, yeah, he, he wanted to quantify movement and he yeah. did. Yeah. He, he was a groundbreaker. Yeah. Love it. Totally love it. Good cool. stuff. So so on that note, hey, Angela, what was your favorite part about being autistic this week? I had a fun little victory last week. We could talk about the whole summer, but I'm just going to talk about a little victory last week. So one of the things I've spent a lot of time on is um, being able to identify when I'm starting to get emotionally dysregulated sooner and get on top of it. But like, sometimes you're just in a situation where you can't. So I was at a wedding. You can't like tell everybody, Hey, stop the wedding. I don't feel I'm, I'm going to not feel good soon. So I sort of made a conscious decision to push through because I wanted to be at the wedding and it was great, but I could feel like I was in sensory overload. I was moving towards a meltdown. I didn't want to leave the wedding. I was sort of in a fight with myself and I took a 30 minute timeout, which just like culturally was really hard to do in like a neurotypical world. It just feels like what's wrong with, like nothing happened. I didn't break my ankle. There wasn't a fire in my car. Like no, there was no ambulance, but I just chose to like dip out of the wedding for what could have been 30 minutes, what could have been forever. I didn't know if I'd get back there. And when, as it happened, I was open to whatever, but as it happened, I tried again to go back to the wedding 30 minutes later and I was able to stay regulated. And I was like, this is such a victory. And one of the things I think that knowing I'm autistic really helps is Uh, For me, I have major problems with alexithymia and interoception. I don't know how I feel. So if my job is to stay emotionally regulated, but I don't know how I fucking feel until I have fallen off a cliff and annihilated everything and everyone around me, like it is so hard to do. And I think a big part of a big part of why our culture is so emotional like why meltdowns are a part of our culture because like how the hell do you figure out how you feel if you can't figure out how you feel exactly that's so. that's the, yeah because it, it adds up and it adds up and it adds up and you have all these different sensory experiences you get sensory overload you got emotional overload and you can only your cup can only handle so much before it runneth over yeah And I caught it beforehand. And I'm just like super celebrating that because the reason I was able to do that is embracing autism as a culture instead of 
pathologizing it just gave me a little grace and space. So I wasn't feeling shame or guilt or like I had to do this wedding some other way. Um, and so I know it's not safe for everyone to unmask, but I do notice the more I unmask, the easier it is to stay regulated more of the time. So yeah, that was my, that was my favorite thing about being autistic of late. That uh, is wonderful. That, that yeah. is, that, that is a, a groundbreaking personal thing. And I hope more people find that, uh, the moment where they're able to do the same. Yes. And, and I turned 50 this year. So if you if you are feeling behind, don't worry, this stuff can take a while to get. I've been diagnosed for it'll be 11 years this month. And I am still learning Cheers. things. Yeah, hold on. I will toast with you. I'm gonna, oh, yeah. We're toasting with water. But here we oh, are. Yeah. Well, that's what I got. Um it's an all new world over here. We've got um, some upgraded sound. So I appreciate those of you who have written in to tell us you love our show, but you don't love our sound. Uh, we went back and fixed that. So if you skipped any episodes, perhaps because you were annoyed by us popping our microphones or the levels not being right, we have re-engineered the episodes. Please go back and have a listen if you skipped any. And if you have someone you can share the podcast with we would love it if you would do so that's fully remastered and better for the experience yes exactly better living okay we will see you guys for the next episode and drop us a note on substack and let us know what you think of edward maybridge Bye. have a good one thanks for listening to the autistic culture podcast If you like this show, you can help other people find it by taking a few minutes to rate and review on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. You can find out more about writing your book with me at differencepress.com. That's difference, D-I-F-F-E-R-E-N-C-E, press, P-R-E-S-S.com. Or getting a psychological evaluation or consult with me at www.mattlowerylpp.com. That's M-A-T-T, Matt, Lowry, L-O-W-R-Y, L-P-P, as in Licensed Psychological Practitioner, dot com. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. And remember, no one ever changed the world by being like everyone else. Special thanks to our content manager, River Robbins, and Aaron Stoner, our producer for making us look and sound good. 